It's that time of year again. Another season of a Transformers show has just sort of appeared. And to the average Joe, this is meaningless. They've never heard of Cyberverse, and if they had, they'd probably be like, Oh, there's a Transformers TV show too? But for us, the Transformers fans, it's another few months of anticipation, speculation, and trying to figure out which country is airing the episodes before the United States this week. It's Singapore. Now that the first season is wrapped up, I'd like to take a bit of time and reflect on the season, or chapter, and summarize some of my thoughts on it. I remember when I first found out about Cyberverse. It was August 2017 when the title was first announced at Investor's Day, and I was thrilled to escape from the lazy, passionless, pointless waste of time that was Transformers R.I.D. 2015. There was light at the end of the tunnel. After a while came the first piece of promo art. A 2D show, I exclaimed. Transformers shows have been exclusively 3D since 2009 when Transformers Animated ended. And from the looks of it, the budget was decreasing more and more with each 3D show. I was excited now. We got a premise. Bumblebee, with wiped memories, must learn who he is and about the war with the help of Windblade. So there was obvious annoyance at the fact that Bumblebee was helming another series and Windblade was getting shoehorned in. She's practically become a franchise legacy character in like four years, and it's pretty annoying because she frankly isn't the most interesting character. In every depiction of her besides the IDW comics, she's just Prime RC, but with wings, and less interested. And in the case of Combiner Wars, a psychopath. I'd like to kill every one of you! <laughs> and they say I'm the crazy one! But regardless, that premise sounded so unique and intriguing. The flashback storytelling device was going to give so much leeway. You'd get stories before the war, during the war, after the war, characters' free time. So much tonal room, too. You could have one episode be upbeat and fun, the next one to be dour and somber, and it would work as long as the present-day tonality is consistent. The declaration of 11-minute episodes alienated a lot of people, but it didn't phase me. I can think of a ton of shows which expertly tell stories within 11 minutes, running with pacing, timing, and heart. Phineas and Ferb, Milo Murphy's Law, Penguins of Madagascar, Big City Greens. I was actually pretty excited to see where they'd go with this. Then came the toy reveals in February 2018. The first six characters. And the toys looked pretty cheap. What would you expect for a kid-oriented toy line post-hunt for the Decepticons? But the designs were amazing remixes of their G1 selves, keeping the core essence intact, but changing it so much. Shockwave especially amazed a lot of people. If the characters were going to have this art style, count me in. Adding to the hype was the Twitter account of Cyberverse's story editor Randolph Hurd, and this guy loves Transformers. It was clear that the entire crew of writers were people who really got these characters, and were so incredibly passionate about it. Look, they're playing a Cybertron version of Cards Against Humanity. I want to be there! I... I wanna be in the room where it happens, the room where it happens. Despite all this, I was cautious. My hopes were pretty mild. After the last night's box office failure domestically, Hasbro was clearly in a state of caution about their brand. Looking at how the cast was stripped down to core legacy characters made me suspect that they were trying to bring the franchise back to its G1 roots, something which the marketing for Bumblebee has now proven. And that can crush creativity in a lot of ways. If the show isn't allowed to explore new material, then what's the point? And just because these people are passionate doesn't mean they're good writers. It could have been a room full of Tommy Wiseau's. Oh, that How is your sex life? So, at this point, I just bided my time and waited. Finally, the clips started coming in around August of 2018. First, the leaks from Comic-Con, and then eventually the Hasbro YouTube clips. And... I think a lot of people were thrown off by these. It was 3D animated. Why was all the promotional material 2D then? I've never seen a show do that. Megatron's movement looked rubbery and weird, like these robotic characters were stretching and squishing with the same level of posability as a human. Thankfully, this was unfinished animation, and I'll gladly report that this is not the case in the final show, even in that exact same scene. Then came the YouTube clips. The desert fight with Thundercracker and sneaking into the Decepticon scout ship. The backgrounds look bland. They might pass in a Wii U game, but not a TV show. The fight choreography was boring. Bumblebee's stinger weapon was so clunky, the sound design just felt pretty generic. 
Although, in fairness, I spent the last year of my life diving into the TFA sound design by Audio Circus, so everything seems generic in comparison. The transformation noise just sounds like remixed farts. The movement was stiff and rigid, though this is often the case for 3D animated shows in their early run and tends to get better as it goes on, and it definitely did. Most insultingly of all, the pre-released 2D concept art for those shows' environments looks way better. It looks beautiful, and I think it comes down to the lack of textures on the 3D models. But most horribly of all, the radio voice. Cyberverse adapts the Michael Bay concept of Bumblebee speaking through his dash radio, but in the movie, he was speaking through recognizable clips, so there was at least some sort of entertainment value derived from recognition. I know what that is! Here, though, he just says generic excerpts that vaguely sound like something you'd hear on TV, and it's obnoxious. Check it out! Hey, Pete. Good, Pete. Yeah, what do you think? How to do donuts! And over 50 different recipes for your microwave oven! Oh, you brought a friend? Are they staying for dinner? Why are you two so mad at each other? Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to tango! This does not get better. I'm a really, really easy person to make laugh, and this never once elicited that reaction from me. It desperately needs to stop. Ratchet clearly fixed Bumblebee's voice once already, can't he just do it again? The clips weren't encouraging, but I was not giving up. It's a pilot episode, it's still trying to find its footing, and it can happily say that it did find its footing. Just eventually. I spent a lot of time trying to structure the many notes I'd taken throughout the first season, but I eventually decided the best way to go about this was an episode-by-episode -episode basis. So without further ado, let's look at the series pilot episodes, Fractured and Memory. Let's start with two issues that apply to every episode. One, why is it called Cyberverse? There's nothing in this entire series that's called a Cyberverse. The word Cyberverse is never spoken. Is that the name for Bumblebee's memories? Secondly, this theme song is so uninspired. It barely even applies to what's happening in the show. I'd call it better than R.I.D.'s of Robots in Disguise button, but not by much. As far as pilots go, this isn't too promising, but many great shows have had less than intriguing pilots. The cold open of Bumblebee speeding off a cliff is so arbitrary. Sophia Isabella is really overacting as Windblade in the first couple minutes. I thought Ratchet fixed your voice box. Oh, never mind. It's great to see you. What are you doing here? But this stopped being an issue even by the end of this one 11 minute episode and never recurs again, so. The revelation that Bumblebee's lost his memory was really dragged out. He should have just said it. Jeremy Levy is a really great voice actor for Bumblebee, but I want Dan Gilvison back. The G1 voice actors are withering and dying and want to get a few of them back before they hit their expiration dates. Early on, it's noticeable that Bumblebee and Windblade's friendship is not explored enough. Their banter rarely seems like two friends who know each other. It's pretty stilted. It isn't until episodes like Cube where their relationship is believable. I'm not sure why Thundercracker is the first villain introduced. It's pretty irrelevant. Bumblebee acting like a dumb child is never funny, and his stupid radio voice doesn't help either, as mentioned earlier. Him cockily taunting Starscream over the radio is just obnoxious because it's his fault the Seekers were so intently after them the whole season. Also, his stinger randomly stops working during an action sequence with no given explanation, just to throw in a blot of unearned tension. There's only one joke in this premiere that made me laugh, and it's this. I'm going to enter your mind using this. Cortical Psychic Patch. Oops, no, that's not right. Sorry. In fact, Windblade gets all of the best jokes in this series so far. On the note of Thundercracker and the Seekers, I'm really not bothered by the fact that Nova Storm is gender flipped, and it kind of surprises me that people were. She's not exactly an A grade cast member. The fan in me really wishes it was Skywarp and Thundercracker, then have Nova Storm and Acid Storm be partners instead of Acid Storm and Thrust then put Thrust with Dirge and Ramjet and make him a Conehead. 
but that's just my preconceived notions of the franchise speaking rather than any particular issue with the writing of this show. And Randolph Hurd has stated that Skywarp is set to make an appearance in some way and there's an impending explanation regarding Conehead Seekers, so maybe this will be alleviated sooner than later. The biggest issues on the table with Fractured Memory are the characters. Everyone is a paper-thin cardboard box. Thundercracker and Nova Storm don't have anything even resembling personalities. In fact, I was under the impression that Nova Storm was Slipstream up until Slipstream's actual introduction because Nova Storm doesn't even get named. Windblade is just a less interesting RC. Sure, Windblade's a competent warrior, but that doesn't make a character. RC's lost tailgate and cliff jumper. She's stricken by grief and overprotective of Jack. What defines Windblade? She has a friend. Bumblebee, as presented in this opener, is just a bratty child who inflames every single situation they're in. Even animated Bumblebee, arguably the most loathed Bumblebee, knew exactly when and where to draw the line and would die to save Sari and his teammates, willingly putting his spark on the line multiple times. The Bumblebee we see here would never do that. What drives these characters? What do they want? The only goal this season presents for them is that they want to locate the Ark and the Autobots, but the camaraderie with the members of this ship is scarcely explored. In fact, we don't even see Windblade interact with any of them. What's driven them before this series started? What makes them tick? There's nothing at the core of Bumblebee and Windblade, our two protagonists. You could argue that the show is just getting started and they'll get to it, but I'd argue if you've just had two episodes of your show that haven't introduced the emotional vulnerabilities and ambitions of your lead characters, you're doing something horribly wrong. Even despite everything I've said here, I was still looking forward to the future. Transformers shows have always had rocky starts. Even Prime, which I think had by far the best beginning, had a few missteps in terms of characterization. The story set up by this season, though, the disappearance of the Ark, which is the last hope for Cybertron, intrigued me. Part of the reason that I waited up until the end of the season is because I wanted to see how well this would pay off. The show was clearly going to be serialized, and I was eagerly anticipating what would come next, and hoping that it could patch some of the gaping sore thumbs of the pilot. And it did. Allspark. This episode was a massive step up. It starts out with a really amusing scene as Bumblebee almost crashes the ship and Windblade freaks out multiple times. I love this scene because I react just like Windblade pretty much whenever I see another car within a 100 foot radius. I think this was a great moment of levity that unfurled organically between these two characters. Allspark does a great job table setting, introducing Optimus, Megatron, Cybertron, and a ton of other things. The Allspark was intriguing and ominous. It introduced another great adaption of Starscream, voiced by Billy Bob Thornton. Seeing a war-torn Cybertron is appropriately intense. The episode introduces the structure used in many episodes, weaving in and out of flashbacks and present day like Lost. Every joke lands. Every action sequence is epic and well choreographed. Flaws? Jake Tillman's Optimus is very wooden. Open the space bridge. I must take the Allspark as far from the Decepticons as possible. Cannot let Megatron corrupt the Allspark. He can do a solid Peter Cullen impression, which is a huge feat in and of itself, but he can't act with it. Even the greats like John Bailey seem to struggle in that regard, as seen in Combiner Wars. Stop. You are off balance. Why were you trying to kill Starscream? He does improve later on, though, and it becomes much less of an issue. Shadow Striker and Soundwave do nothing in this episode, and I kinda wish they weren't there just for sake of cohesiveness. There's no heart or message of this episode, but I think that everything else is done successfully enough to the point that it's forgivable. These are 11 minute episodes. Given how plot heavy Transformers is, it might not be possible for every single episode to be character development driven. But as long as those episodes are done well, it's hard to complain. It's vital we find the Allspark before the Decepticons can get their actuators on it. Also, actuators? It's servos. The Journey. Another solid episode. It introduces the need for Energon really effectively. Even the beloved animated failed to introduce a ton of plot devices and just expected you to understand them from context. Bumblebee tripping over everything made me laugh and reminded me of this scene from the deleted Gravity Falls pilot. Ah! I was right! Oh my gosh, oh my gosh! Go to the stand! Ah! Go to the stand! Go to the stand! Go to the stand! Ah! Wheeljack's a kooky inventor again, and that's something I've been wanting to see for a while. It is also cool to see an animated and inspired design with his beard. 
Optimus is immediate order to retreat upon discovering the speeches needed the Energon to survive really helped establish him as a noble leader. At this point, Optimus Prime was the most well-established character in the entire series, and that's not usually the case. I adore this version of Grimlock. At first, the overly showman-like personality was pretty strange being applied to such a character, but it grew on me quickly. Every line Ryan Andes delivers just drips with charisma, and it's amazing. I kind of expected a Bruce Banner-like dynamic, where he's charismatic and intelligent in robot mode, and an uncontrollable brute in T-Rex mode. King of the Dinosaurs would later confirm this theory. I love the sound design of those creatures. Look! And the Star Trek references were a cool way to establish the episode without making it over-expository. The closing tease caught my interest yet again. It made me very interested in seeing how the story would shake out. Not a lot to complain about here, Whiteout. This episode introduces Slipstream, and even though it makes me happy to see some animated love, it's not enough to make me love the episode. Bumblebee continues to be unfunny, while Slipstream heads to the Himalayas to search for Bumblebee's stasis pod. She's intercepted by Thundercracker, Nova Storm, and Slipstream. It tries to pose Slipstream as some massive threat, but it does not come across. Everything she does in this episode is ineffective. Her character design is the opposite of intimidating, adorable if anything, and the more often she appears in future episodes and gets easily defeated, the less competent of a threat she seems. I kind of like that the Seekers just seem like regular dudes forced to serve in this army. It's a potentially interesting dynamic, but nothing's done with it, and then it just makes them seem like less imposing threats. Something I thought at first was that the Seeker characters were all very one-dimensional. But then I kind of realized that these are just generic infantry, like Viacons or Stormtroopers, except that every single one has an individual design and name. And when you look at it that way, this is incredibly ambitious. I think that's more along the lines of what they were trying to do. Windblade finds Bumblebee's stasis pod crashed in the Himalayas. This rapid of plot development surprised me, although I think they might have played their cards too early because there's a bit of downtime after this episode. Also, how did Bumblebee get from the highest point in the Himalayas to an American desert? Joke of the episode? Megatron is my hero. Here we go, a story that a lot of people have been wanting to see on screen. Gladiator Megatron winning the love of the Cybertronian populace. Mark Thompson is an amazing voice actor for Megatron, and I think that they've just found the successor to Frank Welker. This might be one of the most popular episodes of the season, but to me, it's far from deserving of that. We desperately need more context on the cause of the war. What are the Decepticon ideals that Bumblebee refuses to accept? What are the Autobot beliefs that are causing this war to brew? Episodes like this and Mega Adams do a great job of showing rising tension, but what is the tension even about? It's so vague and undefined. We see Megatron ripping out Bumblebee's voice to keep his plan a secret. Optimus will never know, because you will never tell anyone what you've seen. This is why Bumblebee speaks in beeps in the flashbacks, but <laughs> they can understand his beeps totally fine in every instance we see. What's the holdup? The package is doing what? Talking to you? His voice box later gets restored by Ratchet on board the Ark. Did Bumblebee just forget to tell them? And even if this wasn't the case, couldn't Bumblebee just write Megatron's plan on a keyboard or a piece of paper? You might say I'm overthinking it. But look at these tweets by the writers regarding the episode. They treat it like an episode that's supposed to make you think, but they don't give you anything to think about. And when you do try to think about it, the story falls apart. By far the most frustrating episode because it has the most potential. I think that this absolutely should have been a two-parter because it desperately needed more breathing room. Cube introduces a new touchstone of Cybertronian culture, the sport of Cube, and shows the first time Bumblebee and Windblade met. It's worth noting that Bumblebee definitely just stole a mascot's costume, ruining his career, and is then heralded a hero. I think this is questionable, 
and then Windblade think that this is an ideal choice for a friend. However, this episode really does make the friendship between these two characters believable. Starscream is a jerk just to be a jerk, and it sort of seems out of character. Like, Starscream is the type of guy who does whatever he has to to get himself in a position of power. But then again, this is Starscream on his downtime. We've never really seen Starscream relax before. Does Starscream relax? I kind of waver back and forth and if this is in character or out of character for Starscream. But he's... a joke. In what seems like an intentional way, in a, in a good way. Starscream sabotages the cube game just because he's bored, and I love that. This game is so boring. It's up to me to shake things up a bit, for the sake of everyone, don't you think? Randolph Heard once tweeted, assuring a fan that Starscream wouldn't be treated like a joke, like in Prime. But this doesn't seem to be the case, and I think that Starscream is one of those characters who can ride the fine line between intimidating and pathetic and have it work so well. You interrupted my speech! But don't worry, it won't happen again. One more thing, the set of the Decepticon ship is so bland on the inside. This is supposed to be their home, but compared to animated where they have this super charming furniture and decorations to fit to them, this ship is sterile and has no personality. It's just an uninspired, generic looking U-Wing ripoff and I think that's a shame. Terminal Velocity Who would have guessed that we'd get to see Velocitron in animation? This was a pleasant surprise. I absolutely adore the design of this planet. We get to see Bumblebee's vacation to Velocitron, with his jock friend Hot Rod and his jock friend Blur. Whoever wrote the character bios for the website must have not seen this episode, because they specifically state Acid Storm is male and Blur as a speed talker. Yeah, Blur doesn't talk fast. Blur isn't voiced by John Mosquito Jr. This isn't Blur. I'm all for changing characters, but the entire core of his character is the speed at which he talks and runs. G1 Blur is a compulsive coward and whiner. So I'm here and I want to be there. So where's that get me? Nowhere. And nowhere isn't where I want to be when I want to be there. So what am I doing here when here is nowhere and I don't want to be here, I want to be there. Animated Blur is a stuck-up C-3PO-like chap. Which brings us to earlier today when I attempted to thwart Megatron's plans, but the mission became fatally compromised with some boss got in the way. No, I'm not How many times do I have to say I'm sorry? But is that what you think of when you think of those characters? Or do you think of his speed talking? So I just have to ask, when creating new versions of Blur, why have him talk at a normal speed? This show was clearly intent on casting new blood to the franchise to voice the characters, and that's fine, but some voice actors are just so fundamental to the core of their characters that doing the character without them is just wrong. Blur's self-sacrifice really suffers. He starts the episode as a jerk and a cheater, and ends it sacrificing his life to save Velocitron, but there's nothing to get him from point A to point B. It just happens. We never see him caring about Velocitron or anything in particular. Then all of a sudden he wants to sacrifice his life for it. This is my planet. He stays behind so he can close the space bridge, yet he dies before he closes it. Hot Rod and Bumblebee are standing in the space bridge watching him die when they should have been back on Cybertron with a closed space bridge at this point. So his sacrifice is ultimately ineffective and theoretically Cybertron should be destroyed by rust. Hot Rod declaring, He really is the fastest. Doesn't even make sense. It tries to emotionally tie the episode together, but it just doesn't reach. This episode feels so rushed, and that's a shame because this could have been a heavy hitter emotionally. Blur should have had a number of appearances to shine before dying. I get if you don't want to dedicate a two-parter to a filler episode like this, but at the very least, you could have scrubbed Windblade's pointless dogfight with the Seekers. That added nothing to the story, and all it did was make Slipstream seem more incompetent than she already did. On top of that, right after this dramatic sacrifice, they undercut it with an unfunny joke. I'm glad that's over. Whoa! This episode falls apart faster than the racetracks consumed with the Rust Plague. Also, what's the deal with this dude? Why is he bringing Rust to the planet and others around the galaxy? Did he survive? This was just too elaborate of a story to cram into 11 minutes. Gavin Hignite. 
I think I'm pronouncing that right, tweeted that this is one of the television scripts he's most proud of in his entire career. But I think that All Spark and Eruption, two episodes within the same show, are way better examples of his talent. I don't doubt for a second that Hignite's a great writer. He's currently working on Cyberverse, Marvel Spider-Man, and Star Wars Resistance. I'm sure that the 11-minute runtime was a Cartoon Network demand and out of even Randolph Hurd's hands, and that they'd all prefer to write standard-length episodes. I bet that Hig Knight had to cut a ton of stuff that he wishes he could have included, and that if he were allowed a 22-minute episode rather than 11, and a 30-something page script rather than 15-ish, this would be way more fleshed out. But this episode, as well as Megatron is My Hero, are prime examples of what people were afraid of way back when the runtime for these episodes were first announced. Shadow Striker. After a sparring practice session that was obviously a dumb cop-out, we finally get a formal introduction to Cyberverse's heavily promoted new Decepticon, Shadow Striker. And she doesn't disappoint in the slightest. She's self-aware, intimidating, and what happens to her is so tragic. It's just an amazingly well fleshed out character, well performed, and a standout episode as well. This episode makes Bumblebee incredibly charismatic and likable. Every quip is really funny and I wish we got this as our protagonist more often. Grimlock, I've located Optimus. I'm gonna try something. I don't think it's gonna work. Yep, probably won't work. Wish me luck. Weirdly, the writer of this episode also wrote Whiteout in the Extinction event, in which Bumblebee speaks with his radio voice and is not likable. This proves that even a writer capable of making Bumblebee really likable and charismatic cannot do the same with the stupid radio voice gimmick, which is still a horrible plague to the series. Bumblebee choosing to save Shadow Striker and let her go finally made his character a worthy protagonist. Him being faced with a dilemma, a temptation, and a choice. And the fact that Shadow Striker still resents him after this shows that apologies aren't always forgiven. It was just such a great moral gray area that this episode explored, and a fantastic story that fits snugly within its 11 minute runtime. This is the kind of thing I was looking for. Also, I wish the Seekers had more banter like these two. Ah, uh, I don't even like being left alone in here with him. I don't like being left alone in here with you. At least I don't leak oil every time Megatron walks in the room. Huh, this coming from the bot who got stuck in vehicle mode for 10 cycles? Bumblebee, I want to thank you. You're welcome. I love this Grimlock. Mac Adams. Okay, Bumblebee's a little overpowered, and this scene is a ripoff of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Another completely pointless use of Slipstream, and a cave that's stupidly shaped like Bumblebee to seem mysterious and arbitrarily give their quest spiritual significance. But after this opening, the episode rolls with its premise to great places. The idea of showing Transformers hanging out at a bar before the war, during the beginning of the war, and during the height of the war is an amazing concept and they explore it perfectly. It's a bit, like, predictable beat by beat, but that's not an issue. And can we talk about the lighting in this show? Oh my gosh, it's so good! The way everything glows is so pleasant to look at. It's not just this episode, there's been so many standout visuals throughout this whole journey that I just haven't mentioned yet. McAdams simultaneously existing at every single point in the timeline is awesome, even if a bit of a cheat, I really like him as a personality. Him transforming into something so terrifying off screen that it scares Megatron is <laughs> so freaking funny. The one little gripe is that this episode really highlights the bloated cast of this series. They have this desire to include as many characters as possible, but they wind up not serving any purpose. They should tighten this. Soundwave, Prowl, Ratchet, Chromia, Rack and Ruin, and most of the Seekers could be completely removed, and nothing would change. For example, we see Starscream as the Seeker leader in the flashbacks, while Slipstream leads the Earth Seekers and hunts down Bumblebee and Windblade. From a narrative perspective, why couldn't this just be the same character? Combine some of their personality traits. That'd tie the flashback storyline and the main plots together much better. Sabotage. Shockwave finally gets something to do, and in 10 minutes he proves more effective than any other villain in the entire series up until this point. It's not exactly clear why he wanted Bumblebee to think he was a Decepticon, just so he'd comply and stop being a threat to access his memories for himself and find the Ark. 
There's quite a number of explanations that would make sense, but I don't know, I guess I would have liked a specific one. Who would have guessed that we'd see Rack and Ruin on screen? I was vaguely familiar with him before this. I knew what he looked like, I knew his name, but I didn't know his origin or personality or anything. Unfortunately, Cyberverse doesn't shine much light on this. He's a completely purposeless character, and anyone else in the art could have delivered that line. I wish the cast was tightened a bit more, as I've said already. The flashback story was neat, but pointless. Bumblebee's already been shown to have a massive amount of resolve. He was never tempted to become a Decepticon, and the show never attempts to make you believe he was tempted. There's no real tension or stakes, but it was still entertaining to watch, nonetheless. It definitely justifies itself as an episode, don't get me wrong. Also, it's kind of noticeable that there seems like there's a huge juxtaposition of Bumblebee's maturity between the flashbacks, the memories, and the present. In the present, Bumblebee just acts like an annoying kid, but in the flashbacks when he's standing up to Megatron, he's so strong-willed and mature, also in the memories. He seems like a completely different character. I was surprised that they blew up the scout ship. It speaks to the fast-moving nature of Cyberverse. I love that they introduced this button way back in an earlier episode, and it's been consistently on the dashboard until it served its purpose. Although having a bright red analog self-destruct button is a questionable design choice. Welcome, Perry the Platypus. What took you so long? I'm speaking to you through this amplifier right next to the self-destruct button. You can ride that rocket until your tail falls off. I don't care. Or until you find the self-destruct button, which is right next to the- Ah, oh, dang it! Curse you! Platypus! One last note. I love the little detail that when Shockwave is controlling Windblade's essence, her body posture is completely different. Normally when Windblade's in the memories with Bumblebee, she's free-floating, her arms and legs spread, but when Shockwave has control, he's just standing stiff as a board with his arms by his side, completely not moving, and that's such a Shockwave thing to do. Helitran X. We finally see a human! It's crazy that the show hasn't had any up until this point, and it's sort of refreshing. R.I.D. 2015 had humans just to have humans, and did nothing with Denny or Russell. So even though I think human protagonists add a lot to Transformer shows, I'd rather have them not appear than appear and be uninspired. Bumblebee and Windblade just casually walk around in robot mode at a crowded airport, so they've definitely blown their cover at this point. It's not established why they have to hide from the humans. Is it like a matter of them hunting down? What are the stakes if their cover gets blown? It's not really well defined. I'm not sure why they're hiding. Besides from the Decepticons. Windblade makes this long-winded joke unaware of a security alarm going off, and that's funny on paper, but clearly Jeremy Levy and Sophia Isabella weren't recording their dialogue in the same booth because the chemistry just wasn't there. It really doesn't matter, it's just something I've noticed. This is one of those jokes that needed direct interactions between the voice actors. That's enough. When you have doubts, always remember. Hold the presses! Hold everything! Look at this! We're also introduced to Teletran X, one of our main characters, 12 episodes in. He's pretty funny, and it's partly because every character is horribly annoyed by him. The fact that Windblade just found Bumblebee so hilarious in the earlier episodes made it harder to appreciate his stupid jokes. And maybe if Windblade were annoyed by Bumblebee, then he'd seem funnier to the audience. The way Teletran X keeps withholding all the necessary info just to contrive the plot, it's sort of annoying. I'm sorry, but I cannot answer any questions about the location of the Ark at this time. Why not? Because I am a trap! <laughs> this is the trap part. And not, not true. true. It's old. Where'd the Seekers even find this Ark drone? This really should have been explained. How long have they had this? Windblade getting taken was pretty obvious in retrospect, and even more obvious was that her and Bumblebee would be reunited in like two episodes, only for this to never be mentioned again. And I was correct. They treat it like this massive, dramatic moment, but it just doesn't earn this. There's a ton of instances in this show of beautiful music accompanying mundane scenes. Also, the revelation that the Ark crashed like 65 million years ago was pretty unexpected. And I'm just wondering how long has Bumblebee just been driving around the desert jumping over cliffs?
Maybe if he were Cliff Jumper, he would have gotten it. <laughs> Matrix of Leadership. It's kind of silly having their means of cortical psychic patching blown up, only to find a new means of cortical psychic patching two episodes later. I hate that Teletron X doesn't know where the Ark is, and proved to be completely pointless. This episode continues the trend of dimensionalizing Bumblebee and Optimus during the war. Optimus' guilt towards destroying Cybertron is powerful. Alpha Trion appears, and then dies. Classic Alpha Trion. Also, Animated Love, the Autobot High Council, and Starscream Sonic Screams. I never would have guessed we'd see those again. And just, ugh, oh, I love the art design of this Cybertron. The animation looks way better than in the pilot episodes. The sequence where they lose Prowl is amazing visually. And I never mentioned this earlier, but the artistic choice of like all the explosions looking super hexagonal, it's really pleasant. It's a really cool way to cut costs, but still have it look nice. And yeah, speaking of Prowl, we finally see him. Though this could have been any already established character rather than a new guy. I love the story of Optimus refusing to leave a bot behind. All in all, a solid episode, but the lesson's kind of lost when the next episode proves that leaving Windblade behind was a good thing because it helped him find Grimlock. Siloed. This episode did some much needed dimensionalizing of the Decepticon characters. Thundercracker all of a sudden has a huge personality. A mostly incompetent new recruit who keeps screwing everything up. Slipstream though, she finally gets fleshed out in the way she should have been in Whiteout, acknowledging her past failures and giving her the incentive to truly perform in the future. Her interactions with Shockwave and Starscream are amazing, and introduces prejudice between Cybertronian ranks and struggles with superiors. She has some great moments, quips, and puts up a fight. Desperate to prove herself a competent threat. When Leanne Marie Dobbs is given a good script to work with, she really sells this character. Do you not agree? Of course! We will see to it immediately! And, uh, looking forward to seeing you. <laughs> Why did I say that? Looking forward to seeing you? That was so... extremely low intelligence. Speaking of low intelligence... Storm, Thundercracker, report! It's just a shame that typically she isn't with Slipstream. It's just a shame that the strong characterization disappears in the rest of the episodes of the season. A couple smaller things. Windblade just snaps apart her stasis cuffs? What's the point of even having stasis cuffs then? It reminds me of this scene from Beast Wars. <laughs> 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 Optimus, maximize! Windblade slicing the Null Rays off was timed so perfectly. Ah! Timing is everything. Finally, it's weird how Windblade's sword is just randomly introduced as an important relic from Kaminus in the fight scene over it, but like, there's no pre-established information about this sword in the entire prior series, it just becomes important. At the end of the day though, Marvel Rising writer Margaret Scott proves that she is great at writing the villain characters, and I want to see her come back for season 2. King of the Dinosaurs. At this point, Teletran X is starting to wear out comedically. Bumblebee's radio voice is getting on my last nerve, but Grimlock! God, I love this Grimlock's personality! Grimlock's vocal codation for his dinosaur mode sounds really cool. Listen to this. We are friends! No! We are Grimlock friends! Friends like me! The flashback to the crashing arc is such an exhilarating and entertaining sequence. How can I save the crew? Go to my main console and. Whoa! Never mind. His Bruce Banner slash Hulk dynamic between his modes is so creative and an amazing extension of this character from previous iterations. He just might be my favorite iteration of Grimlock with the exception of Fall of Cybertron. I want him in the main cast and I want to see him fleshed out more. Just like with Grimlock himself, Randolph Hurd could have done more with this episode. King of the Dinosaurs should have had a flashback storyline like Thrill of the Hunt. Imagine if Thrill of the Hunt just mentioned RC once and only showed 30 seconds of her memory wipe. It's not as satisfying, is it? Once again, this episode could have done with a longer runtime. 
have a concurrent flashback storyline as Grimlock adapts to his prehistoric accommodations and charms the other dinosaurs. What was the point of the fake tension that Grimlock might be dead if it was just gonna be resolved in less than a minute? Grimlock's walk cycle is kinda clunky, but it's cool how his transformation animation is based off of Fall of Cybertron. How did no one notice a giant, robotic dinosaur rampaging downtown? That's as believable to me as the Transformers remaining a secret after the Battle of Mission City. A major metropolis in broad daylight, thousands of people were out and about, over hundreds died who surely had friends and loved ones, millions of dollars of property damage, surely a couple people would have noticed something fishy. Anyways, I'm kinda confused about the whole homing device in his crown. How was he able to construct that with prehistoric technology, which is to say, no technology? What was his plan with the crown? How did he get so far away from his home? There's just a lot of gaps here. And this shot where Bumblebee throws a rock is just framed in the most engaging way. It's such a small thing, but like, I love this shot, whoever storyboarded this. Overall, another episode that fell victim to the 11 minute run times. It wasn't able to have the emotional punch it was going for, but it introduced an amazing Grimlock that Randolph Heard excels at writing. And Grimlock's lullaby makes me so happy. The Extinction Event after a massive improvement, Slipstream reverts back to a largely incompetent leader and definitely deserving to be fired. Shadow Striker, unfortunately, gets relegated to the same status. The Big Bad Shockwave wants to wipe out all life on the planet, as you do. It'd be more intimidating if we'd actually seen organic life on the planet. Besides random eight-year-old, all we've seen of Earth is a barren wasteland devoid of any life. The only organic life forms that we're supposed to care about as an audience are the other dinosaurs who are long extinct. Speaking of, you'd think that this extinction event would have a massive personal impact on Grimlock after the death of his brethren, but nothing came of it, and this was a tragic missed opportunity to give Grimlock a character arc. Why does such a massive thing as the extinction of humanity get resolved in 10 minutes? Could this have been the finale? Why throw something so huge at season one? I hope they know where they're going from here because it's a little hard to raise the stakes from total planetary extinction. Did anyone notice the massive alien ship in orbit above their planet? Has no one noticed a freaking space bridge that's been in orbit since the Jurassic era? Anyways, Shockwave continues to prove that he should really just be leading the Decepticons. Honestly, from a narrative perspective, him and Megatron should have been the same character. The first half of the season spent establishing Megatron as this massive threat, only for him to completely disappear from the narrative in the second half. Meanwhile, Shockwave appears as the primary antagonist in Big Bad of the second half, after only appearing in a single episode of the first half where he did nothing. It's just another example of a far overbloated cast. Also, where the heck did Windblade get a cargo plane? Did she, did she steal that? Does she have a flying permit? Do Transformers need driver's license to drive? Oh my god. Awaken Sleeping Giants. Finally, we approach the two-part finale of Chapter 1. Transformers finales are almost always completely plot-driven and not one for emotional climax. That's a shame, but I'm not gonna ding Cyberverse for it. Cyberverse didn't have any season-long character arcs in the first place, or themes, so all I can really do is rank the finale based on how well it builds upon everything that's been set up. And boy does it. Awaken Sleeping Giants is just a rush. It's basically a 10 minute action set piece, and it's by far the best fight sequence of the entire series. All of the characters' powers and abilities come into play and bounce off each other really well, like Windblade's propellers, Bumblebee's stinger, and Grimlock's brute force. It's clear, concise action, and I actually found myself wanting to watch that scene multiple times. It was really well blocked and thought out. I've said it before, I'll say it again. This Grimlock is amazing. Fall of Cybertron has an edge over it, but if they'd really define this character more and explore his psyche, I think he has the potential to beat him out. Every line is hilarious, and that's all to Ryan Andes' credit. He can carry a script. Grimlock falling into molten lava and glowing golden while breathing fire 
makes me so happy. There's a really engaging game of cat and mouse, as Teletran X spies on the Seekers, and Shockwave's drone spies on the Autobots. Also, Mount St. Hillary! I feel like I should have predicted earlier that the Ark would be crashed in the side of a mountain. Did anyone else get Beast Wars vibes as they tried to awaken the Autobot crew in stasis on the Ark in a cave? I feel like I should be saying more about it. There's some questionable history regarding what eras the different species of dinosaurs lived in, but when is that not the case in Transformers? Awakened Sleeping Giants isn't supposed to be some great think piece. It's supposed to be an adrenaline pack build up to the end, and that's exactly what it is. Eruption isn't quite as smooth flowing as Awakened Sleeping Giants. The action's not as clear to follow with a lot of awkward shots, though that isn't so much an issue with Gavin Hignite's script as it is with the storyboard artists. But hey, it's still better than every single action sequence in my storyboards, so I don't get to complain about sloppy storyboarding. I sort of predicted that Teletran X would sacrifice himself in the season finale, and he did. But it was well handled. It wasn't overly dramatic and tragic, like Bumblebee leaving Windblade behind, but it was appropriately somber and more impacting than Blur's death simply because we'd spent more than 10 minutes with Teletran X. Upon dying, I was nervous that they'd pull the cartoon classic and have Teletran X turn out totally fine within like 5 minutes, and they did. But Teletran X being in charge of the arc was really funny. I'm doing the best I can. I'll try everything. Turn that music off! Putting him in their new position really rejuvenated his worth, and I'm looking forward to seeing him again. Maybe as a recurring role and not as a lead in every single episode. That'd make him easier to appreciate. Shockwave turning on all of the Decepticons is so twisted. They seem to really take the prime route with their Shockwave. He's ruthless, logical, and completely devoid of emotion, as opposed to G1 and Animated, where he's just Megatron's sucker. Animated Shockwave is still my favorite, though. I think that his biggest asset is the sheer amount of damage he was able to do to the Autobots with his limited appearances, and how intimidating he was. They rode him in a position where he never got defeated once. He undeniably came out on top of every single engagement besides the finale where everyone got defeated who was bad. But anyways, yeah, side reverse. Yeah, I wonder, will Shadow Striker and Slipstream find out that Shockwave was gonna leave them to die? How will they react to it when they do? And will the two of them face consequences for their constant failures? I'm pretty sure that in a real military, with the success ratio that she's had, Slipstream would have been demoted a long time ago. The only exception is General McClellan. Random note, the Seekers changing color under the lighting looks really cool, but sorta doesn't make sense. They're surrounded by super bright magma. Why'd that invert their color schemes? Cyberverse's finale still leaves a lot of unanswered questions. What caused the Ark to crash, and what happened to the Allspark? What the heck has Megatron been doing this whole time? My prediction is that he's dead. He got killed somewhere between the flashbacks and fractured, and Shockwave's permanently in charge of the Decepticons. I waited until the season finale to see how well it gave clarity to the questions set up in his pilot, and it didn't give clarity to those questions. That's sort of a shame, but I'm also glad that they won't randomly retcon some new plot point to push the series forward in future seasons. I'm glad that the premise of the series was substantial enough to carry it forward. At this point, we've just got to look forward to Chapter 2. And I am looking forward to Chapter 2. I'd like to see some adventures across the galaxy like in The Journey, rather than hanging out on the desolate wasteland that Earth has proven to be. Will any humans notice an entire massive Decepticon battle fleet invading their planet? Probably not. I bet they're all looking in the other direction when this happens. In summary. Cyberverse is a very ambitious series, trying desperately to take the series in new directions from what we've seen on screen before, and that is so appreciated. But they spend so much time doing that that they seem to leave the core of their stories underdeveloped. They skip over the core foundation of an episode in order to show a cool trip to Velocitron or Megatron's rise to power, and all that does is leave the episodes feeling empty when they should feel invigorating. Sometimes, though, they get it. A great number of episodes hit their stride and tell an amazing story, fully thought out, with strong thematic ties all condensed into 11 minutes. 
Would I recommend it? To an average Joe, maybe a couple episodes. The Journey, Shadow Striker, Matrix of Leadership. But to a Transformers fan, absolutely. Watch Cyberverse. And I know that if you're a Transformers fan, you've seen far, far worse than this. Cyberverse has a passionate creative team that tries desperately to be worth your time, to be interesting, even if it doesn't always succeed, is the fact that it is attempting to accomplish something that makes me root for it and stick by it. The unfortunate reality is that there are real human emotions wrapped around these episodes. The writers are all so pleased with their work, and criticism hurts. It doesn't matter if it's rational and gently put, whenever I release a project to the world, in school or on this channel, it, if it gets flack, it can sting a little. And I'm sure that some of the comments in this review would sting a lot. So if any of the creative staff for Transformers Cyberverse finds their way to this video, which I highly doubt, then I just want to say that I'm sorry if this hurts you. It takes a massive amount of confidence to put your work out there, especially at this scale, an internationally viewed cartoon. And just remember that at the end of the day, I'm the random high school student from Oregon, and you're the professional writer with a university degree from LA. I'm sure I could learn far more from you than you could ever learn from me. If you were to ask me to give it a number ranking, I wouldn't really know how. I'm not one of those pretentious art students who's like, art can't be judged and defined with a numerical value. I clearly just spent a good while ripping this show apart, so I'm not above judgment. I just don't exactly know how to relegate all of this work the creative team did by slapping a number and a letter on it and calling it a day. Just take into account everything I said earlier and consider that if you're on the fence about watching it. But I can't tell you where I'd put it amongst his Transformers show brethren. However, let's lay out the competition. Given the identity of this channel, it's no secret that my heart lies with Transformers Animated has an amazingly well fleshed out cast of protagonists with well defined emotional journeys and clear destinations for those journeys. Every single character has a distinct personality and a clear purpose in the story. The show has complex interwoven plot lines, an awesome mix of episodism and serialization that I've barely seen anywhere else. Every episode has a core value that the characters must come to realize, and the show as a whole is thematically tied together as it tells the story of what it means to be a hero. It's not perfect. No show is. The AllSpark sucks, Sorry's a brat, the main villains go pretty underdeveloped, but it's by far the best thing to come out of this franchise, and I wish it wasn't cancelled! Transformers Prime is a close second. Even though sometimes the show just doesn't know where it's going, Retreading the same ground by just having a good 50% of the episodes revolve around some Cybertronian weapon that just happens to be on Earth, Transformers Prime has a very intriguing cast of characters. Every single one of them has a motive, a backstory, a personality, even if the writers might have not exactly had plans for where they'd end up. It introduces some of the best interpretations of characters from the entire franchise, and the animation and art design is absolutely gorgeous and by far the best 3D animated show I've ever seen visually. Every single frame is a joy to look at and the soundtrack is fantastic as well, even if a bit repetitive. It really sums up the show in that way. The Transformers Generation 1. What started out as a cheap corporate cash grab managed to win the hearts of a generation. Is it because children are dumb and will watch anything? Yes. The plot is crap, the characters are paper thin, the animation is cheap, especially under ACOM. But what keeps this show alive in hearts is that the writers and voice cast had so much fun. Every episode is an absolute blast to watch. It's so corny and charming, telling joke after joke delivered with overacting unlike anything you've ever seen. It's not ironic enjoyment, it's supposed to be this way. Cap it off with the soundtrack of Transformers the movie, the massacre of all your favorite toys, and Peter Cullen's performance as Dying Optimus Prime, and this series earned its rightful place as the touchstone of a franchise. Beast Wars Transformers The atrocious 90s animation and the very slow burn of its first season make it hard to jump into. But when the show finds its footing, it really finds its footing. 
telling creative and unforgettable stories, as well as truly developing its characters in a volley of existential themes and symbolism. It's the most unique route Transformers has ever gone, and that ensures that it sticks out. Realistically, it probably should be above G1, but I'd far rather watch G1 than Beast Wars. Transformers Rescue Bots You can tell that everyone involved in this series gave their all. It relishes in its lighthearted tone and entertaining leads. More entertaining than a kid's show has any right to be, to deliver an outstanding entry to this universe. The bouncy flash animation works wonders with the tone, and the sheer number of episodes ensures that almost all of them have to explore some crazy creative concept, most of which work. I wouldn't watch this unless you have a three-year-old with you, but if you do have one, turn this on, because you're both going to be thoroughly entertained. Plus all this crap. Alrighty, 2015 is sadly in the top 10 Transformer shows, and Beast Machines is up for debate. As crap. And Cyberverse goes in third place. If the show continues like it's been, it'll go down as one of the greats of this franchise. It's shown so much promise for improvement, and I hope and pray that they've regrouped between the first and second season's production to figure out what works and what doesn't. It's ambitious, and that's what earns your engagement. Despite all the criticisms I've laid out on it over the last 50 something minutes, I find myself eager for more, and this is why. However, this isn't a lock. Cyberverse is far from over, I assume. R.I.D.'s first season ranked a lot higher than the show's final result. It wasn't terrible, it's a little generic, but it could be fun at times and showed promise for improvement. Then it didn't improve. It hit the same beats over and over and over, nothing paid off, nothing meant anything, and before long it became a chore to watch earning the malignant of many Transformers fans, including myself. I don't think Cyberverse will go this direction, however. I think that the show's first chapter is a little flower petal, waiting to bloom into something spectacular. And until season two debuts, I'm gonna anxiously pray that that's the case. Autobots, roll out.